So as you guys all know, I've been putting a ton of hours into watching Apple's developer tutorial videos from WWDC, with a focus on trying to figure out the ins and outs of Apple Silicon. But just yesterday, I discovered Apple's Platform's State of the Union video, which is an hour and a half long. And let me tell you guys, I found some stuff in there that is so impressive that it's gonna knock your socks off and remove any doubts you have of Apple Silicon being great for the Mac. And for some reason, I haven't seen anybody else on YouTube talking about what's in that video. And by the way, I just created a new Apple Silicon Max Explained playlist that I'll link to at the end of this video. And they basically show off things like how the new chips will work, why this is gonna revive gaming on the Mac, why Apple Silicon won't have discrete GPUs and much more. So definitely check that out after this video is over. Now before we dig into the one and a half hour long video from Apple, I want to show you guys something very interesting about Apple Silicon that my brother Max just discovered. If you're familiar with the camera space, you probably heard about the new Canon EOS R5 camera and the fact that it uses an unconventional HEVC 422 format. Well, he tried editing some footage from that camera on various computers, and even his $15,000 Mac Pro struggled with it, until he brought it onto his iPad Pro, where it played back perfectly smooth. The reason for that is because the iPad Pro has Apple Silicon, and Apple Silicon has special HEVC hardware transcoders, and all of that is also coming to the Mac and likely getting improved on top of that. So it's very likely that the very first 13 inch MacBook Pro with Apple Silicon is gonna edit this modern footage better than a lot of high end computers. And just this morning, the NDA was lifted off of the brand new Sony A7S III camera. And that camera also shoots using the HEVC codec because it's the future of video recording and Apple Silicon is ready for it. So without further ado, let's get right into that video. Using Apple Silicon inside Macs is an amazing new direction for the future. It will open the door for huge improvements to speed, graphics performance, power consumption, security, and more. I don't know if you caught that, but he said huge improvements to graphics performance. So while it seems like ditching dedicated graphics is a bad thing, Apple has some tricks up their sleeve. Unifying architectures across our product lines will allow us to bring unmodified iPhone and iPad apps to the Mac for the first time. We've been working on it for several years and we are so happy with the result. Yes, he just said unmodified iPhone and iPad games, meaning no changes whatsoever from the app developer, meaning that the very first Apple Silicon Mac will have access to the entire iOS app store on day one. And those apps are gonna work perfectly as you'll see in just a minute. Productivity apps like iWorks Pages, Numbers and Keynote run great. And this is one of the most demanding Pro apps, Final Cut Pro, with real-time rendering of several movie streams. And Logic, our music creation powerhouse, easily keeping up with large projects. We already worked with a number of our partners to bring the apps to Apple Silicon as well. Here's Adobe Photoshop, already taking advantage of the new architecture and running fast on this new Mac. And Microsoft has brought up their Office apps, such as Word and Excel. Of course, our developer tools also work great on Apple Silicon and can be used to create native apps. And as you can see here in Activity Monitor, when we say Big Sur and all the software is running great on Apple Silicon, we really mean it. Every single bit of code you just saw is 100% native. So basically, Adobe and Microsoft have been working directly with Apple to get all of their productivity apps running natively on Apple Silicon. So if you use Photoshop, Lightroom, Premiere Pro, any Microsoft app or any Apple app like Final Cut, Logic Pro 10, or Xcode, they should all work great on day one. Macs will be more secure. They'll be faster and more responsive. They'll have longer battery life, and they will simply be much better overall for graphics, making the Mac an amazing platform for games, for example. So that confirms it. 
better battery life, and much better overall for graphics, specifically for gaming, which we'll get into in just a minute. And for the first time, the Mac will have a dedicated inference accelerator for machine learning applications with a neural engine coming over to the Mac. Of course, one of the things I'm most excited about is that we're bringing our high performance GPU architecture to the Mac. We've already seen our GPU architecture do really well in the iPhone and iPad Pro. And in the Mac, this architecture is going to be great for pro application and games. So we're getting new machine learning accelerators, the new neural engine, and apparently even more high performance graphics for pro apps and games. This transition will give our developers a common architecture behind all of our products. So whether you're building software for the Apple Watch, iPhone, iPad Pro, and now the Mac, there's a unified scalable architecture behind all of them, which should make it easier to write and optimize your application across all of our platforms. It really is a really exciting time. And there you have it from Apple themselves. The change to Apple Silicon is gonna make writing and optimizing apps much easier for developers since you have a common architecture across all of Apple's platforms. So we should start seeing even more apps and games for the Mac than ever before. And performance will be off the charts in many areas. In particular, the Apple Silicon Unified Memory Architecture, powerful GPUs, and our highly optimized Metal APIs are going to allow for responsive, complex image editing workflows, such as the one you see here in Affinity Photo. Or Cinema 4D, an app optimized for Metal for real-time interactive 3D editing and modeling. You can see how smoothly it runs on Apple Silicon. Every Mac with Apple Silicon is going to have that powerful GPU and Metal implementation, making Macs a fantastic platform for running games like Dirt Rally at high frame rates. I don't know about you, but Apple seems to be focusing a lot on gaming. As you can easily see, the neural engine allows for a whole new experience. And a Mac with an Apple SoC finished the task much quicker. So for machine learning applications, Apple Silicon is gonna be the way to go. Macs will stay Macs the way you know and love them. They will run the same powerful pro apps. They will offer the same developer APIs Macs have today. They will let users create multiple volumes on disk with different operating system versions. And they will let users boot from external drives. They will support drivers for peripherals. And they will be amazing Unix machines for developers and the scientific community that can run any software they like. I don't know if you caught that, but he said booting from external drives? That's the first time I'm hearing anything about that. We've made it really easy to bring your app to any user on any Mac by making your app universal. A universal app contains code compiled both for Apple Silicon and Intel processors. The two binaries become slices in a single executable, and the operating system chooses the right one for the hardware architecture of the Mac the user is running on. Everything else in the app is the same. All the resources, such as images and machine learning models, are identical for both hardware architectures. This means you can distribute a single universal app to your users, and it runs on any Mac, whether they use Apple Silicon or Intel processors. So this shows that you don't have to make separate apps for Intel and Apple Silicon Macs. But how easy is it? This work will only take a few engineering days. Even for some of the most complex software packages, we've generally seen that it only takes a few weeks to get a full version up and running. So just a few days doesn't sound bad at all for common apps. We're also passionate about making sure that open source projects thrive on the Mac especially if they benefit the larger software developer community and can help accelerating the port of other software packages. So we have already done the initial work for some of the more widely used open source projects to help the community get started. And we'll be publishing patches to them in the next days. So Apple has already done the hard work to bring all of those open source codes to Apple Silicon. Unity is an industry-leading platform for creating interactive real-time 3D content. It is used by millions of developers to make games and apps that run across Apple's iPhones, iPads, Apple TVs, and Macs. Now we've been working with them, and within just a few weeks, they were able to update their powerful 3D editing and game development tools to take full advantage of the power, performance, and features of the new Macs built with Apple Silicon. As a developer artist, you can use the Unity Editor to create, edit, and build your games. So let's see it in action. Here we have loaded Unity's Spaceship demo project into the 3D editor, and it's all running on a Mac with Apple Silicon. Unity plans to release a production version of the editor, runtime, and tools to enable you to easily create, build, and ship your games, optimized for both existing Intel-based Macs 
and those with Apple Silicon. So with powerful tools like these, we can't wait to see all of the amazing new games you're going to be able to create. This means that Apple has been working directly with Unity to get their game engine running great for Apple Silicon, getting it ready for game developers. But what about the current games that are available on Intel-based Macs? What if the developers won't have time to optimize them before the release of Apple Silicon? Well, that's where Rosetta 2 comes in. Mac OS Big Sur will include a new version of our emulation software, Rosetta 2. This provides compatibility for existing Mac software. Now, Rosetta 2 is just an amazing technology written from the ground up for Apple SOCs, allowing existing Intel apps to run seamlessly alongside your native apps. It's able to take Intel executables and translate them into native ARM instructions. Rosetta uses a number of advanced techniques to let binaries run very fast, even during emulation. This is especially true for Metal, where Rosetta produces native calls to the GPUs built into Apple SOCs. So even high-end games execute with incredible performance. But is this actually going to work well for pro apps and games? Well, check this out. OK, let's take a closer look at apps you saw earlier in the State of the Union, starting with Dirt Rally, which really shows off some great features of Rosetta. The translation cache was built during the install from the Mac App Store, completely transparently, which means there's no glitches due to a need to translate new blocks of code. As is really important for games with motion and real-time audio requirements. And things just work. Even this game controller that I really need to be able to stay on the road here. And the CPU instructions have been translated very accurately, whereas the graphics commands are sent through to the native GPU. There's simply no frame drops or lags on the controls. It's amazing. He mentioned that Rosetta 2 translated the game to work on Apple Silicon during the installation of the game, so there's no drop frames and no lag for audio or game controller input. And that's for every current game that doesn't get rebuilt and optimized for Apple Silicon. Now let's look at a pro app, Affinity Photo, which really helps show off that emulation has very little memory overhead. I've got this huge 82 megapixel image loaded here. There's no additional memory of it for having such a large file open under Rosetta. And because the translation cache is file backed, just like the original executable, there's little additional overhead here too. And we didn't just focus on the speed of translation. The translation cache is also secure, thanks to the code signatures that are checked before execution, just like the original binary. Saving a file is an all native operation through our optimized storage stack. The emulation doesn't add any copies or buffering. Coupled with native metal, I'm able to apply these effects quickly and save them just as fast. So that was Affinity Photo running great using Rosetta 2 emulation. App extensions can be built as universal binaries too. And since extensions run out of process from the host app, Rosetta can even emulate extensions when they're being used with a native host app. So end users can rely on extensions to continue working on Macs with Apple Silicon, while you work on porting them to run natively. And other standard plugin architectures, such as audio units, run out of process under Rosetta too. Drivers utilizing the DriverKit API introduced in macOS Catalina are in the same situation. That was something I didn't know before. Extensions and drivers are going to be handled by Rosetta as well. We are planning to make unmodified iPhone and iPad apps available in the Mac App Store once we launch our Macs with Apple Silicon. In fact, all the apps that users purchased on iPhone and iPad that are eligible to run on the Mac will simply show up as purchases in the Mac App Store as well. You, the developer, will have total control over whether you wish to participate. So every unmodified iPhone and iPad app will simply show up on the Mac App Store and run on an Apple Silicon Mac on day one, including the apps that you already purchased. Let's look at an iPad game, Monument Valley. This app is the exact same one available in the iOS App Store. When we launch it, the app appears in the dock like any other Mac app. I can minimize and reopen the window. Menu bar is an important part of the Mac experience, and iOS apps get a menu bar generated automatically. For instance, the edit menu here with the usual entries and the app menu as well. You will notice preferences here, which puts up an in-app preferences panel automatically created from your app's iOS settings bundle. So you can minimize your game, and game settings will automatically be routed to the preferences page in the menu bar. We have our beautiful graphics. Mouse clicks are mapped to tabs. I can zoom in as expected on the trackpad. I can click and drag to rotate and create a path for our character. The game is fully playable. 
So let me remind you that that was an unmodified iOS game, and Apple is automatically translating touch inputs like taps, hold and drags, and pinch to zoom to work on an Apple trackpad or a mouse. So a lot of simple games will just work perfectly. And as you saw earlier, you can also use a game controller for more complex games. And even better, since Apple is bringing keyboard and mouse gaming support for the iPad, that means they're doing the same for the Mac, for game categories like first-person shooters and MOBA games. To achieve our users' expectations while also remaining compatible with the apps, we play a couple of tricks. First, we have a new app bundle format, which wraps your application as is. This allows the user-visible app to be freely renamed or moved. Second, to ensure that apps are launched as compatibly as possible, we use a feature we introduced in macOS Sierra called App Translocation. This allows the iOS app to be efficiently launched from a sanitized path that is not affected by the user's actions. So Apple isn't just bringing iOS apps and games to the Mac, they're doing everything they can to make sure they run great with little issues. So let's look at another iPad app called Documents. This application supports iPad multitasking, which means the window on the Mac is automatically resizable. I can even go into full screen. As you see here, we have macOS scrollers, and I can scroll with two fingers on the trackpad. The app automatically adjusts to macOS appearance, dark and back to light. And since this app supports multiple windows on the iPad, it also does so on the Mac. Now, I don't know about you, but that looks like it runs incredibly well with multiple pages and full screen mode in mind. Choose a photo and edit it. I have an iOS app installed and it provides a photos editing extension. This extension automatically appears in photos extension list. I can choose it and enhance my photo. So when iOS app extension is able to work alongside the native Mac app automatically, which I never expected. The new widgets are written in Swift UI, making it easy to share code across iPhone, iPad, and Mac. New widgets that work seamlessly across all three platforms. This means that a developer can create one widget for the iPhone, and it should automatically work on the iPad and Apple Silicon Macs. Xcode's new Swift UI app templates include everything I need to create common code to share across platforms, and then tailor for each UI idiom. These groups and their targets are created automatically in new projects and help me keep good layering as my project grows. Apple's goal is so that developers can create common code that works across all of Apple's platforms. So there are minimal code changes for each one, like adjusting the UI. This is the next big step in bringing you a language and API to build fully native experiences across Apple's platforms without compromising on what makes each platform unique, all using Swift and Swift UI. So that is Apple's goal. And I need to remind you that this is just the beginning. At next year's WWDC, Apple is gonna continue adding features so that developers need to do as little work as possible to write code for all Apple devices at once. There are so many new capabilities and APIs that we didn't even have time to talk about here in the State of the Union, such as the new ways CoreML allows you to encrypt machine learning models and to deploy them via iCloud or tvOS, which continues to be the best platform for the big screen. Now with AirPlay support for 4K HDR streams, multiplayer support for games, and many more new and enhanced functionalities. If you didn't catch that last bit, multiplayer gaming support for Apple TV games is coming. And since Apple is blending all of their platforms, Apple is also adding multiplayer crossplay between Apple devices, including the Apple TV. So hopefully this long video helps you understand how Apple Silicon Macs are gonna work much better than you previously thought possible. And if you're wondering how good the performance is gonna be, definitely check out the full playlist right over there. Or if you're interested in how gaming on the Mac is gonna be revived with Apple Silicon, watch that video right there. And be sure to click the circle above to subscribe and check out our new Apple product merch in our merch shelf right below this video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.